Hello, hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about a super important concept, power. And power analysis is used most of the time to estimate the appropriate sample size in an experiment. Now, let's start with the definition of power. It is the probability that a statistical test will reject a false null hypothesis. Not the friendliest, right? Basically, it means that power is about the probability of detecting an effect, a difference of some kind, given that the effect is really there. In a nutshell, the bigger the experiment, the bigger the power, as in the more likely to pick up a difference. So, the main output of a power analysis is the estimation of the appropriate sample size. And it is super important for several reasons. First, it could be that our sample is too big, which would be a waste of resources and an ethical issue if we work with mice, for instance. Or our samples could be too small, so it could well be that there is a genuine effect, but we miss it because we don't have enough power. That would also mean a waste of resources, by the way, because of a poor design. If we write a grant application, we need to justify the sample sizes we propose and more and more funding bodies are asking for the actual power calculations. Scientists hate it, of course, but it is a good thing really, as it makes people think more about experimental design. And it is good news for the mice. Finally, for publications, reviewers are starting to mention power. If an author claims that there is no effect or no difference between, say, two genotypes, a reviewer may come back and say, wait, the difference you are mentioning seems interesting to me. Did you have a sample big enough to pick it up? So power matters. Okay, so how does power look like? We can try this figure and go over its elements, starting with the null and the alternative hypothesis. So here we are thinking about the probability that an observed result occurs if the null is true. We have the null hypothesis in red here, that's the absence of an effect, and the alternative hypothesis in blue, corresponding to the presence of an effect. We can also think of the red curve as, say, a control group and the blue one as a treatment group. Next, we have the type 1 error, which is the failure to reject a true null hypothesis. And alpha is the probability of making the type 1 error. It is the probability of claiming an effect which is not there. It is the error we make when we say, yay, there is a difference here, whereas actually there is not. The famous p-value that we get from a test quantifies the probability that the effect we observe occurred by chance alone. It's the probability that a difference as big as the one observed could be found even if there is no effect. Now, we can never be sure, but we want to be as confident as can be, and we usually settle for 95%. So, if a null hypothesis is true, if there is in fact no difference, we accept there is a chance that we observe an interesting difference, but we do not want that chance to be more than 5%. It follows that to establish statistical significance, we compare alpha and the p-value. If it is smaller than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and the result is significant. Yay! So, we believe that the difference is real, and vice versa if alpha is bigger than 0.05. Next, let's talk about the other type of error, the one we tend to forget, whereas we so should not, the type 2 error. The type 2 error is the failure to reject a false null hypothesis, and beta is the probability of making that error. It's the probability of missing an effect which is really there. And the power is the probability of detecting an effect which is really there. Now, if we look at the blue curve, we can see that it is partitioned between power and beta. And we can see how the two are linked. There is a direct relationship between power and beta. And the bigger the power, the smaller beta. And if we make the area of the curve 1, that relationship is as simple as that. Okay, so the general convention is that power equals 80%. So, keeping in mind the relationship between power and beta, it follows that the accepted beta is 20%, which means that a true difference can be missed 20% of the time, which is pretty high, right? 
And it is all because of Jacob Cohen. In 1962, this guy wrote a seminal manuscript on power and he thought, okay, type one error is the big one because it can have really nasty consequences. So he went, let's say that the type one errors are four times more serious than type two one. Then to quantify the type two error, we just have to go 0.05 times four equals 0.2. Voila. Pretty arbitrary, right? But back then, no one really argued against it because bigger samples mean more money. So of course, 80% was good enough and still is, even though more and more people are starting to argue against it. Next, the critical value. When we compare sample means, for example, we will always observe a difference as means will never exactly be the same. But the question is, when do we call a difference significant and meaningful? So a difference can be very small to very big. And somewhere we have to draw a line beyond which we call the difference significant. And that line is the critical value. And that critical value is of statistical nature as it is calculated using the information that matters, namely the size of the difference, the sample size on which we build the confidence we have in that difference and what we choose to call significant. Now, a power analysis is the relationship between six variables, the difference of biological interest, the variability of the data, both of which together will give us the effect size, the desired power, the significance level, the sample size, and the alternative hypothesis. First, the difference of biological interest. This is to be determined scientifically and not statistically. It is the minimum meaningful effect of biological relevance, as in the smallest difference that matters. The larger the effect, the smaller the experiment will need to be to detect it. It means that we have to have an idea of the difference we are after before we run the experiment. It may seem counterintuitive, but it is not actually, as not every difference matters. Some are too small to be reported or explored further, so we need to determine the smallest meaningful one for us. And how do we do that? Well, from previous research or a pilot study, for example. Then the standard deviation. That's even more counterintuitive. We need to have an idea of the noise, the variability in our data before we have even collected it. It seems like an impossible task, and yet we need that information to determine our sample size. Now, we have to remember that pretty much always we will be comparing group or groups of interest to control of some kind and this control in all likelihood will have been measured before. It is a wild type or a mouse or baseline that we or someone else will have used before. So the way to do it is to look at the viability of that control and use it to estimate the viability of our group of interest. Okay, so we have seen the first two variables, the following two we've talked about already, that's alpha and the power itself. Then the fifth variable is sample size, the one we are after most of the time. And we are left with the alternative hypothesis, which can be a bit confusing, actually. It is about choosing between one or two tail tests, also referred to as one or two sided tests. Now, the tails or sides in question are these here on each side of the distribution. This is the distribution of a difference. So under the null hypothesis, we have a difference of zero. And as we move away from it, the difference increases and we are more and more likely to reach significance until we reach the critical value. And then bingo, we do reach significance. It is really about the question we are asking. If it is, is there a difference? Then we look at either side of the distribution and we split the rejection region into two and we have 2.5% on either side. Or we ask, is it bigger than or smaller than? In which case, we look only at one side. Now, if we look at these two graphs, we can notice that the critical values are different between the approaches. For the one tail test, the critical value is closer to zero than for the two tailed one, which means that a smaller difference will be significant. So the choice of a version of a test will affect directly the likelihood of reaching significance. In fact, with the same data, it is about two times easier to reach significance with a one tail test than a two tailed one. Arguably, the choice should be led by the science and the actual question we are asking. But in truth, much more often than not, people use two-tail tests, regardless of the question they are actually asking.
Not that we are right to do so, but since one way to consider statistical tests is that there are tools we use to quantify our level of confidence in what our data are telling us, it makes sense to use these tools in a consistent fashion so that we could compare our findings between one another. So two tails it is. So power analysis is about getting information about five out of six of the variables. And once we have fixed any of the five, a mathematical relationship is used to estimate the sixth one. And pretty much always, the sixth variable will be the sample size. One last thing, GraphPad Prism does not compute statistical power or sample size, but the companion program GraphPad StatMate does. And now that we have been through the principles, it should be easy for you to use it. Thank you for listening and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary.